This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology, where we bring you the latest interviews in hematology oncology news. I am the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. This week on Clinical Correlation, does the relationship between a patient and an oncologist ever end? And I'm joined this week, as I always am, by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. And Dr. Henry, it feels like, for those of us that are in in the business, it, it feels like we're all being shipped off collectively like to a war. I mean, it's getting crazy out there with COVID-19. It really does. I'm sure everyone listening has either their personal practice or their hospital or both um, changing things. For example, starting tomorrow, they're going to take my temperature when I walk in the door. Um, we're preparing to give lectures to house staff, not in person. And um, so, so teaching has to continue, but not in the usual format. So it's causing fascinating changes in the way we learn, practice, and of course, take care of ourselves. And well, you and I don't want to go through what's happening on the news hour after hour. I just remind our audience, please take this seriously. Surface washing, um, interacting with people, keep your social distance and wash your hands. And I did a little experiment with myself on Friday. Every time I put my hand up, what was it doing? Well, holding a railing, pushing an elevator button, scratching my head. You don't realize. And that's, of course, how things go viral. Yeah, absolutely. I realized how itchy my beard is. So I shaved it. <laughs> so I don't stop mm -hmm. touching my yeah. face. So um, one thing I wanted to mention, of course, everybody should know by now about the Johns Hopkins dashboard. That's just the raw numbers at MD Edge and Medscape. Uh, Medscape, of course, owns and operates MD Edge. We are throwing our full editorial weight behind uh, covering this and, and what's happening on the ground and guidelines and a bunch of case studies. All of that can be found at medscape.com and mdedge.com. Um, you can search COVID-19 in any one of the search bars and you can find all of that. You mentioned that we, uh, as, a, as a community, as in the lay media, everybody has to do all of these things virtually now. You and I record this podcast or this intro. We do it by Zoom and everybody who wasn't familiar with Zoom, even down to undergraduates, are now familiar with Zoom. I also wanted to throw out as a suggestion, if any of you are tech savvy, you might consider Twitch as a way to do this and stream it live, but then also have it as a recording. Twitch gives you the a much better platform through which to chat and have a discussion during a lecture or any grand rounds or anything that you're doing. That's just a suggestion. And it segues nicely into what our interview is all about this week, which is part one of two with someone that you know very well. And it's all about how some apps you heard, have heard of and some that you probably haven't can help you operate in your daily life as a person, but and most more importantly, as a professional. And this is Dr. Bernard Mason. Well, I think our listeners will really enjoy this. Dr. Bernard Mason, one of our oncologists, hematologists, uh, a very close friend of mine and sometime mentor, many times mentor. And it's a great story why he is doing this podcast on electronics for us, electronic media, because some many years ago when computers first came out, I said, you know, Bernie, you got to try this. It's wonderful. Dave, no, we stay home and read. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll fix his wagon. I bought him a computer. <laughs> snuck into his house when his kids were home, put it on his dining room table and left. And of course he couldn't stand it. And he, he's really good at all things electronic, fast forward to now when he knows more than most people, let alone um, doctors and IT people. So he's gonna cover a few things tonight. We're gonna do a two part series, as Nick mentioned. So this one, if you're hearing uh, Thursday morning when it airs and, and then again next week, and just to highlight three things he's gonna cover on this first episode. Um, storage. So OneDrive versus Google Storage, syncing your data so you don't lose it, or your PC or your Apple device to the cloud, to a mobile device. So that's really important. You can work and sync wherever you are. Photo backup. You know, these priceless things we're taking so many all the time now because we have a, our mobile device, our phone, and you don't want to lose them and you want to search them. So there's a way to save and to search. He mentions how he had a fender bender once a year ago and wanted to see what that looked like and talk to the insurance company. So he asked Google to search Fender Bender and among all his photos, thousands, it found it. And then finally, he talks about your traveling. Uh, one day we'll probably be able to travel again when this is all over. And there's a way to do Google Maps on mobile devices, online, offline. One he mentions in particular, here we go. So I think you'll really enjoy, we call this kind of electronic media electronic age for medical professionals. Yeah, and it's um, he, going through it, he gives a clear endorsement to OneDrive or Google Drive. We won't spoil that for you. He also gets into the nitty-gritty about price and, and what you get with which service. 
and also why this is so important, not just for the everyday individual, but for medical professionals, specifically the capabilities of backup size and what you can do offline. All of that obviously so important. So this is part one of two. Part two will be available in episode 63. That's the episode that drops on March 26th. A clinical correlation this week by Dr. Alana Yerkowitz has a topic I never really would have considered before because I've never been uh, an oncologist or an oncology patient, and that is, that she poses a question. Does the relationship between the oncologist and the patient end, even after a positive outcome? Well, I would say after a positive outcome or sadly a negative outcome, I had a patient that I've taken care of for several years with melanoma, and he finally succumbed to the illness and it was on a weekend when I was not on call and I called the wife on the following Monday to tell her how sorry I was. And clearly during that call, it, it's so weird. And I know the oncologist had this happen. She thanked me, of course, he's passed away, but she thanked me, our cancer center, all our nurses, caregivers, every part of the cancer center for what was happening. And I said, you know, hopefully we're not going away and we're here if you need us in a day, a week or a month. And she said, I will, in fact, I'll come in. So it even doesn't end after a negative outcome, and of course, um, rarely ends with a positive outcome because patients like that reinforcement. Yeah, absolutely. So clinical correlation coming up after the interview. Before we get into the interview, I just want to say if you have any unique perspectives, ideas, stories, um, or any sort of commentary on how hematology and oncology is handling the COVID-19 outbreak in the Western Hemisphere or abroad, feel free to email the show, podcast at mdh.com. We will discuss it there. And we're looking for case studies, anecdotes, how it's affecting you mentally, how you're powering through, what's happening in your unit or your neck of the woods. Um, we're, we're, we're really looking for that kind of information right now. So feel free to email the show, podcast at mdh.com. And, and of uh, course, but, to mention, uh, you can not only this episode, but previous ones, I think you said some 60 plus, Nick. And so we're on mdh.com slash hematology dash oncology or mdh.com slash podcasts. Absolutely. And we're available wherever podcasts are found, including YouTube, Spotify, Pandora, Apple Podcasts, of course, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Podcast Addict, all of the good ones. We're there. Uh, You can search our back catalog. This is episode 62. 63 is going to be coming up with uh, part two of this conversation, but let's get into it right now with part one with Dr. David Henry and Dr. Bernard Mason. Welcome to this podcast. I'm Dr. David Henry, your host for Blood and Cancer. You're listening to Blood and Cancer, which airs every Thursday morning, wherever you get your podcasts for your mobile device or even for your computer. And we come out each week with topics of interest, in this case, for blood and cancer. But we're departing a little bit this week from our usual blood and cancer focus and talking about electronic media, mobile, stationary computing. And to help us do that, I'm delighted to be here with my mentor and friend and colleague for so many years, Dr. Bernard Mason, who is a professor of medicine, oncologist, hematologist at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia. Bernie, thanks so much for agreeing to do this. Thanks for having me, Dave. You're very welcome. And Bernie, do you remember your first computer and how that happened? You gave it to me, Dave. And it was a huge terabyte of memory? I don't understand why anybody would want to have a computer. And, and the rest is history. And as I recall, that IBM PC from way back when, we're dating ourselves, had 20 megabytes of memory. So for those under 40 listening, they probably have one photo, which takes 20 megabytes of memory. Well, our topic today is um, Bernie has just raced ahead of the curve with all things electronic and computer and mobile device. And so a, an issue of a magazine I subscribe to called Maximum PC came out in the fall, and it said best free software. So I asked Bernie to take us his assignment to look through this for software, especially for mobile devices or basic use of your PC or in particular your uh, mobile device, whether it's an iPad type or a phone, cell phone type, and where might this be useful for those of us in medicine, whether it's hematology, oncology, or any field of medicine, be useful. So Bernie's going to step us through that and beginning with, I think you're going to go to storage first. So tell us about what you found. Well, I thought we would start with the PC and maybe go back and forth between uh, a PC and a mobile device and maybe even in some situations both at the same time. Okay. So some of these things are either free or cheap. Some of these um, apps or programs are already on your computer. You might not even know they're there. I'm going to start with OneDrive. OneDrive is a cloud storage offered by Microsoft. 
it's on your PC. If you have a Windows 10 computer, it's there. It's a folder in the PC. It's in your uh, user file. Um, and uh, Microsoft automatically gives you uh, five gigabytes of storage for free just to have a Microsoft account. Actually, if you've had one drive on your computer since 2012 or before, you get 10, meg 10 gigabytes of storage. Um, that doesn't seem like very much. Today, that's not much storage. But in fact, you can have even more storage than that. If you have a, an Office 365 subscription for Microsoft Office, uh, you get 1,000 gigabytes, a terabyte of storage for free as part of that. Um, and you can also buy storage from Microsoft uh, uh, fairly cheaply. So that's on 365, Microsoft 365. Microsoft, yeah, Office 365. Office 365. Which is a subscription uh, version of Office. In fact, most people get their Office programs that way. If, you, if you're university affiliated, if you have a... Uh, if you're a student or faculty, or if you have an email address that ends in edu, you can get um, Office 365 University version, which is good for two computers, and you get a thousand gigabytes or a terabyte of storage for eighty dollars for four years. So that's twenty dollars a year for a, gig a terabyte of storage. I didn't know that. That's terrific. So, the, if you have, uh, if you look at your computer, you'll find the OneDrive folder. You can then download a OneDrive app from the Microsoft App Store for free. This will put a small uh, cloud-shaped icon in your system tray. That's on the um, taskbar, on the right side of your taskbar. And if you click that um, and go to Preferences, you can decide what you want backed up on your computer. You can do a, a continuous synchronization of your computer with the cloud. So if you click the little cloud icon um, in the system tray and go to more and go to settings, you can then click or unclick a box that says save space and download files as you use them. That will, you can either click it or unclick it. If you, you can make all the files in the cloud so it doesn't take up any space on your hard drive, or you can have all the files on your computer uh, either way. And then you can, uh, in the preferences, you can also select what folders on your computer you want continuously synced. Once you've done that, you can have your document folder uh, synced to the cloud as you're working in the background um, to your OneDrive in the cloud. You can then download a OneDrive app for your phone, sign in to your Microsoft account on your phone, and all of your work from your laptop, your desktop, your tablet, your phone are all the same everywhere. You can alter a document on your phone. When you get home, it'll be uh, changed on your computer. You can delete a file on your computer. It'll be deleted from your phone. So all of your work will be available no matter where you are, either on an iPad, a tablet, a phone, a computer, a laptop. I have my, I, I have my OneDrive on five different devices. So whatever I'm working on, it's going to be the same when I get back to my computer at home. You and I have talked about in the past Dropbox. Is this similar to that? It's similar to Dropbox. It's more integrated into your computer. Uh, it's cheaper. Dropbox is um, more expensive. Okay. Um, Microsoft is actually now a cloud company. Microsoft uh, makes its money off the cloud now, not by selling software anymore. And uh, OneDrive has actually been rated as the top uh, cloud um, solution really? at this point for uh, personal use. Okay. Um, it's it's much cheaper than Dropbox, and I think it's more secure also. Okay. So I know you want to cover more about backup, and um, you want to talk about Google Drive, which I, I, who doesn't have a Gmail account and can be on Google, and I didn't know what you're about to tell us about Google Drive and backup and syncing. So Google Drive has actually changed in the last few years. Um, in May of 2018, uh, Google, and Google often does this, they retire programs without telling you. They retired the Google app. There was a Google app for your personal computer, and you had an actual Google folder on your personal computer. That's all gone. They also decoupled uh, Google Photos, which I'm going to talk about later, from the Google Drive. So, that, so if you look at the photos on your Google Drive, there won't be any beyond July of 2019. Because all Google Photos after July 2019 are going into a secret place 
that's not on Google Drive anymore. Uh, Where'd it go? Well, I'll talk about that later. It's All still right. there, but not, not on Google Drive. All right. Um, so Google Drive uh, app disappeared a few years ago. In its place, Google now has two software options. If you have a regular Gmail account and you go to Google Drive on the website and click the gear in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see Get Drive for Desktop. Click that and you will have two options. One is called Backup and Sync, which is what's available if you have a regular Gmail account. The other is File Stream, which is available if you have a corporate Gmail account. So if you have a regular Gmail account, it's Backup and Sync. If you download that app, it will place a little cloud on your <laughs> taskbar in the, uh, in the system tray. And if you right-click that, you also have the option of backing up whatever folder you want on your computer continuously in the background without knowing anything. So you can say, I want my document folder backed up, I want my photos backed up, whatever. And uh, Google Backup and Sync will continuously back up just like the OneDrive does. Uh, I actually have both of those on my computer running at the same time. It doesn't seem to interfere with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a Google app for your phone. You can download that to your phone. You can then work on a document in your phone, and it'll be uh, changed on your computer. The same thing as the OneDrive. You can have it on five different devices if you want, your tablet, a phone, a laptop, a desktop, and you can do work uh, while you're traveling, and when you get home, it'll be on your home computer. So Backup and Sync is similar in the way it functions to the OneDrive. Now, there are some advantages to the G Drive. You can get... Uh, you get free storage from Google about 15 gigabytes, not about, you get 15 gigabytes free just having a Gmail account. Okay. Um, if you're an alum, alumni, alum of um, some universities or a student or faculty, some of the universities will give you a corporate Gmail account with unlimited uh, cloud storage, infinite cloud storage. And you've done that here at Penn? Yes, University of Pennsylvania. I have a Penn uh, Gmail account with unlimited cloud storage. So for that, I have FileStream on my computer. It's a virtual drive backing things up. And uh, I actually take courses at Temple University. I have a Temple email address and a Temple Gmail account um, with infinite cloud storage. So you can get a lot of storage for nothing depending on your local university. So I think you're going to talk about, um, with regarding backup, we all take pictures. And um, maybe some of our listeners still use a camera. Uh, those are becoming few and far between. Hope the camera shop is still in business. But the cellular phones, the uh, Samsung, the iPhone, all have phenomenal cameras. So you take all these pictures and you don't want to lose them. So I know you're going to discuss with us how to back up your photos. You don't want to lose your photos. Most of us don't carry cameras around anymore. When, when I travel, I pretty much rely on my phone. Um, you can back up your phone. If you have an iPhone, you can back it up to iCloud. But iCloud is expensive for adding um, cloud storage. They only give you five gigabytes of storage, which isn't very much. And then no. you have to pay for more. Um, the other thing is Google has the best um, image recognition and searching of all of the services. So I actually like Google Photos. Google Photos uh, has been changed in the last few years. As I mentioned before, it's not connected to Google Drive anymore. If you download the Google Photo app to your phone, you can have the option of it continuously backing up all your photos. Uh, you can have it set so it only backs up on Wi-Fi, so you don't use cellular service. And you can decide whether you want to have the photos backed up in the original form or a slightly compressed form. If you do it in the slightly compressed form, Google gives you infinite storage for free. Um, you can then see all your photos on your home computer. Just click the Google Photo app uh, in your Google account, and you can then you'll have all your photos there by date, and you can search them. Uh, for instance, I recently did a search on my Google Photos for three little girls to find photos of my three granddaughters all in one shot, and it'll find that. Wow. Uh, I, want, I, I had a 
somebody rammed into my car in a parking lot a few years ago. I wanted to find the photo of damaged front end, and I just put that in Google. Google is very good at finding things like that. And I was able to find the damaged car photos from three and a half years ago. And to be so, clear, you talked about the icon tray at the bottom right on your computer. So to do this, you need to go to your Google account to find Google Photos, or is this on icon tray? Well, on your phone, there's a Google Photo app. Okay. On your computer, there is no app. And if you click the icon in, on the bottom, you'll get the Google Drive, which has the old photos, but nothing past a couple of years ago. To see the, the all of your Google Photos, you have to go, uh, if you go in, uh, if you use Chrome or some of the other um, browsers, if you go in the upper right hand corner and click the Google account, the Google apps, one of them is Google Photos. Oh, yes. Click That's that right. mm -hmm. uh, and you'll see your photos. Or you can go to Google. You can go to photos.google.com and uh, sign in under your Google account and see them there. But the easiest thing is to find the app in the, and there's a tray of apps. Uh, in your Google account on in your browser. You could just click Google Photos and they'll all be there. Um, so you can have it on your phone and on your computer. Now if you do the the backup of photos in a slightly reduced form, um, all of the photos going back to the beginning are, are in there and they're not counted against your Google Drive uh, storage. Okay, so they're just there's an infinite amount of space somewhere. It's not in your Google Drive anymore. Okay. If you do it in the original form, which is a little bit big, more space, then it will be counted against your Google Drive. You'll see a reduction in your Google Drive storage as you, as you back up photos, even though you don't see the photos on the Google Drive. A little mysterious, but you will use up space. Uh, you'll have to pay for it eventually that way. Now, as an example, if you back up in the slightly reduced form a photo of three megabytes, it comes out a little bit over two megabytes if you download that photo from Google Photos. So you lose a little. Uh, and if you're a stickler for the original form, then I would recommend Amazon Photos. Now, a lot of people don't realize if you have an Amazon account, you have an Amazon Drive. Most people don't know that. I didn't know that. Uh, we all, and if you have an Amazon Prime account, you have a very big Amazon Drive. So the Amazon Drive, you could find it by going to your Amazon account and uh, clicking in the uh, area which says your account and then down the long column of things including payment and so on and so on you'll see your Amazon photos and below that you'll see your Amazon drive. If you click that you'll see a drive um, with your photo stores and your video stores on, on there. You can download an app from Amazon uh, to your phone or to your mobile device? Uh, well, both. Okay. You can download an app uh, from your Amazon account in that if you click Google, if you go to your Amazon account, click Accounts and Lists, click Your Account, and then click Your Amazon Drive, in that place you will find uh, an app that you can download onto your PC, an Amazon app. And that will go in your system tray, a little cloud, just like the other ones. And that will allow you to see all your Google, all your Amazon photos on your PC. Okay. On your phone, you can go to the App Store, download the Amazon Photo app. The Amazon Photo app works like the Google Photo app with one difference. If you have a Prime account, the photos can be backed up in full form. There's no reduction in, in size. They're, they're in the original form of the photo and you have unlimited space. Uh, Amazon Prime gives you unlimited space. Amazing. Uh, otherwise, you only get five gigabytes on an Amazon Drive. You have to buy more space. But if you have an Amazon Prime account, one benefit of the Amazon Prime account is you can back up infinite photos in full, uh, in the uh, full format or the original uh, form without any reduction in size. And so the Amazon uh, Photo app on your phone you can set it up where every picture you take will be backed up to Amazon. You could see it on your home computer. You could see it on your phone. It'll be back. You could say back up only on Wi-Fi, just like with the Google Photo app. The one difference is it's uh, you have infinite storage in the original form of the photo. You don't lose anything. Phenomenal. Well, let's then go to maps. I know you want to talk about. Uh, we all likely listening to this podcast, travel for business or pleasure, and you want to know where you are, where you're going, you might uh, use up minutes or roaming and expensive. 
but there's a way to do that with Google Maps that you want to discuss. Yes, everybody loves Google Maps, and if you're traveling, you might be in a rural area or in a national park where there's no cell signal, or you might be in a foreign country um, and not want to use cellular data. Now, I know many of us now, when we travel abroad, will get an international plan for data, but maybe you don't want to use that every single day. And most of them charge $10 a day now to, yes. to have your original cell service that you have back home. But you might want to not use the cell service, or you might be in a remote area in the mountains somewhere and not have cell service. So you can download Google Maps on your phone for use when there's no cell signal. Um, if you click in the upper right-hand corner on Google Maps on your phone or tablet, uh, sometimes it's the upper left-hand corner. It depends on whether you've recently updated your Google Maps. Uh, you'll see a menu, and halfway down the menu, uh, it'll say Offline Maps. If you click that, it'll say Custom Map. If you click that, you can then create a map. You can decide uh, anywhere you, you want, whether it's the United States or a foreign country. You can move the Google Maps over to that place. Decide how much you want to download. It'll show you how many megabytes of data is going to be downloaded. My phone has 256 gigabytes on it. You can have the whole United States, the entire United States in Google Maps is about a gigabyte. Amazing. So you can take an entire country and put it on your phone. Or on the East Coast, I have the East Coast and the West Coast, because I, I travel to the West Coast a lot, uh, and save it as an offline map, give it a name. I could say the Northeast from Pennsylvania to Massachusetts. I save that on my phone. Uh, it will up, it has to be updated every month. So it'll be on your phone for about a month and then it, then it has to be updated. Uh, and if you're in an area with no cell signal, you'll have a map. It'll give you directions. It won't have the traffic because you're offline. If you're in a foreign country and you don't want to use cell data, go into your cellular settings, turn off roaming, turn off cellular data, but leave the phone on. Don't put it in airplane mode. Your phone needs a signal to operate GPS. So the phone is on, but no data. So the uh, GPS is working without charging me? Yes. If you turn off data, mm -hmm. uh, the GPS will be working, but it's not using any data. It just allows the, G the GPS needs the phone to be on to work. It needs a signal to be working. Right. Um, and then uh, you can use your map a as normally without any cell data. And you can use it in a foreign country. You might. You also save cellular data if you do a lot of traveling and uh, probably save battery, a little bit of battery also. Okay. All right. Now, well, the alternative to that, if okay. you want a different map option, is a program called Here We Go. H-E-R-E-W-E-G-O. All one word. Here We Go. You can okay. download the app to your phone. It's uh, Apple or Android. It has maps for every country in the world. Um, offline maps. You can download the maps for any place you want and it'll give you uh, driving instructions, etc. and it'll be there forever. You don't have to worry about updating it every month. So that's an alternative to the Google Maps. Here we go. And that concludes the interview portion of our show this week. Be sure to tune in again for episode 63 for part two of this conversation. When Blood and Cancer returns, It'll be Clinical Correlation with Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. Welcome back to Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I am Nick Andrews. It's time now for Clinical Correlation. I'm Dr. Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. I'm preparing a journal club this week on a palliative paper that came out recently in the Journal of Palliative Medicine called The Last Day Narratives, an exploration of the end of life for patients with cancer from a caregiver's perspective. Through interviews with caregivers, it beautifully and importantly characterizes themes that arise from a caregiver's perspective after caring for a loved one with cancer on the last day of his or her life. One theme that arose was centered around the relationship between the provider and the patient. As the paper put it, quote, caregivers had a strong sense of attachment to the provider and considered their relationship ongoing even after the patient's death, 
end quote. Then they gave an example. Mrs. X described, quote, I still keep in touch with all the doctors and nurses at the hospital because they are like my family, end quote. This theme made me stop and think, when, if ever, does the relationship between an oncologist and the patient end? This certainly comes up. The relationships in our field are powerful, and they are one of the most rewarding parts of our work. I've spoken on this podcast before about patients who were cured, yet still wanted to see their oncologist years later, hesitant to change back to their internist. But what if the news isn't so good? Then what? For example, when a patient and an oncologist decide that hospice is the right next step, it can become confusing initially who to call. What calls go to the oncologist's office? What calls go to the hospice nurse? I actually very recently addressed this in clinic with a lovely elderly man who was so used to directing all questions to our clinic that he was confused that he would now have a new team. Patients can certainly feel abandoned if the oncologist chooses no longer to be involved once hospice is involved. Personally, I think it's crucial to keep the relationship going even if most of the day-to-day care decisions are transitioned to the palliative team. As the paper describes, the impacts of healthcare providers very directly influenced the overall experience of the caregiver near the end. Comfort, relationship, emotional support, all of that matters a lot, even if chemotherapy is no longer being prescribed. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll tune in next time for Clinical Correlation. And that concludes episode 62 of Blood and Cancer. Let's get to this week's credits. Blood and Cancer is hosted and produced by the editor-in-chief of MD Edge Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. It's also produced by executive editor Mary Ellen Schneider. Our guest this week was Dr. Bernard Mason. The Clinical Correlation segment is written, recorded, and produced by Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. All MD Edge podcasts are produced by our editor-in-chief and Medscape editor-in-chief, Dr. Ivan Aransky as well as executive editor Kathy Scarbeck and multimedia editor Terry Rudd. Social media is produced by Kyla Clark. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, your audio engineer and your audio editor, Nick Andrew.